So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about development. Um, so a little bit of background, which I think got covered in some of the last talks, so I'll move through it quickly. So most of the common and disabling and expensive health problems that our countries face um, begin during childhood and adolescence, I think we're pretty clear on that, have behavioral as well as genetic and environmental components, um, and we know pattern according to socioeconomic status. So the conditions I'm talking about here range from common non-communicable chronic diseases, cardiometabolic disease, obesity, many cancers, and also psychiatric conditions, depression, schizophrenia, substance abuse. Um, so many people have said, fantastic, if they have behavioral components, we should be able to prevent them by improving kids' lifestyles, starting early in life, teaching children to eat well, to exercise more, to use drugs less. Um, if it were only this simple, I think Teresa's introduction gave you a good sense of what some of the obstacles are and some of the subsequent talks, too. Um, the punchline is that many lifestyle interventions around food choice, around physical activity, around drug use um, help children initially, but their benefits aren't sustained very long, which is also true with adults. Um, and the uptake and efficacy of these interventions is even more modest in kids from families of low socioeconomic status. We really struggle to get interventions out there and to stick and to work in low-income communities, and this is particularly true in the U.S. Um, so how can we do better? Um, I would argue, as I think some of the other speakers are, is that the first thing that we need to understand is that behavior doesn't occur in a cognitive vacuum, that the larger cultural environmental environments that kids find themselves in really do shape their behavior in profound ways. And um, particularly, I would argue the socioeconomic conditions that children live in, the neighborhood conditions, the school conditions, and the family conditions, present a powerful array of stressors, both social or psychosocial stressors and physical stressors, that impact the way they behave and the downstream biology. And that we need to recognize that these contextual stressors and the impact they have in thinking about how to su successfully understand kids' health and their behavior. Um, so these stressors, I would argue, and I think the evidence shows pretty clearly from both human studies and preclinical studies, affect the way that children's brains develop and do so in ways that affect downstream lifestyles and also downstream biology. Um, so this is a broad overview of what I'm talking about, the idea that the context that kids grow up in um, affects their brain development in ways that has implications for the way they eat, the way they engage in physical activity, the drugs they use, um, and that in turn has implications for downstream disease-relevant physiology. We also know, thanks to work on stress physiology and some of the ideas that Professor Akil talked about, that these stressors have direct effects on biological systems that are important in disease, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, that last slide is pretty vague. It just gives you a sense that the brain is likely to be a key interface, um, a key interface between the context that kids grow up in and the way they behave in downstream biology. And that interface might be an opportunity for us to get additional insights about the drivers of health-related behavior in biology and also potentially an interface for intervention. Um, so where might you start? Um, if you were thinking about looking at stress and the brain and behavior, um, this is a relatively new field. It's just something in the last decade or so that folks have been coming together around in neuroscience and health psychology and health disparities. Um, we and others have argued for the importance of some of the networks that you've already heard about. So the cortical amygdala network that's involved in processing stressors and threats and responding to them, that network connects to centers in the brainstem and nuclei in the hypothalamus that control outflow from the autonomic nervous system, from the HP axis, and those hormonal products of those systems we know can shape the functioning of organs like the heart and the lungs and tissues like the immune system in ways that can contribute to the kinds of long-term chronic health problems that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk and account for a lot of the burden in our countries. Um, also likely to be quite important are corticostriatal networks involved in processing reward. As Dr. Hare talked about those extensively in his um, lecture earlier on in this session, and we know those are quite important in 
food choice, in drug and alcohol use, um, likely in physical activity too. Um, so understanding those is going to be quite important in how context shape them. And we're also increasingly understanding that these brain networks ha are engaged in bidirectional crosstalk with peripheral systems. And particularly interesting and important, it seems like, are is the crosstalk that these networks have with the immune system and the innate immune system. And it's becoming quite clear from animal models that crosstalk between innate immune signaling in the form of cytokines and the reward network and the threat network seems to be part of the mechanism by which contextual stressors and socioeconomic status relate to subsequent health problems across the life course. So what might this look like empirically? I'll show you a recent study that we did that tries to bring some of these ideas together under one kind of empirical roof. Um, so um, this is a sample that we've been studying in Chicago of 12-year-old um, kids. This is at the first wave of a multi-wave longitudinal study we're engaged in. And as you can see, it's a racially and ethnically diverse sample. Um, it matches the demographic characteristics of the broader Chicago region. Um, and Chicago, as um, many of you may know, is well known for skyscrapers, well known for pizza, and well known for violence. Um, so we have an unfortunately high amount of neighborhood violence in our city. Murder rates are among the highest in the country. Um, and what we've done is use geocoding techniques here to map rates of murder in our sample. And what you can see is, um, oops, I went the wrong direction. But what you can see here is the color responds to the neighborhood murder rates in the five years preceding our study. The red areas are the places where you have murder rates that are about 10 times the national average. And the blue, the blue areas are the ones that are right about the national average. Um, so you can see that in Chicago we have high murder, but it's very concentrated in a couple of different neighborhoods. For those of you who know Chicago, um, the bottom red area is the south side near the, near the University of Chicago, and the other big red splotch is the west side, not far, far from O'Hare Airport. Um, what we did is geocode to look at neighborhood murder at the block group level of spatial resolution. So these are communities of about 500 to 3,000 people. And we were interested in the idea that the brain might be the filter through which neighborhood conditions, particularly around violence, gets interpreted and gets appraised and becomes the transducer of those experiences into cardiometabolic health. Um, and our particular interest in this study was in functional connectivity in the central executive network. So this is a network that's anatomically distributed and connects areas in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with the posterior parietal cortex. This is an attentional network. It's similar to the cold networks that the last couple of talks have referred to. Um, and the way this is assessed is that we put children in the scanner for 10 minutes, and the instructions are to think about nothing. So this is a resting state assessment. We're not interested in their brain activity during a particular task, but what happens when we let them think spontaneously? And the output is how connected these nodes are. And we know from developmental research that the more these nodes are co-activated, the stronger the functional connectivity amongst them in this resting state task. And in functional studies, this network has been shown to be important not only in the sorts of cold deliberative judgments that the last speakers have talked about, but in the way that kids interpret and appraise threats, their ability to reappraise threats, so to make different meaning of them than they might automatically, and also shown to be quite important in helping people to get rid of intrusive thoughts, so unbidden images that are threatening. This network gets activated when people are trying to switch gears and not think about those intrusive thoughts. Um, and what we find is something quite, pretty interesting, which is that if we look at kids who have low connectivity within this network, they're represented by the red lines. There's a strong relationship between the amount of murder in the neighborhood they live in and multiple aspects of cardiometabolic health. So here we're looking at their body mass index, a measure of total adiposity. We're looking at the number of signs of metabolic syndrome for which they qualify according to the pediatric cutoffs. We're looking at insulin resistance. This is the HOMA estimate based on glucose and insulin. Here we're looking at leptin. 
And I could show you half a dozen other indicators of cardiometabolic health in these 12-year-old kids. And what we see is a fairly strong relationship between the amount of violence and worse cardiometabolic health. But in the kids who have high functional connectivity within this central executive network, that relationship completely goes away. The slope is zero. Um, and this all persists when we adjust for other things that you might think are correlated with neighborhood violence, so things like the level of environmental pollution, the availability of, fast, of fresh food within their neighborhood, the general level of poverty, the general level of neighborhood segregation. So we're pretty certain that the relevant exposure here is violence rather than poverty per se or physical pollution, but you can see these effects are moderated quite strongly by functional connectivity in this network, providing some clues that it may be important in helping kids filter or not filter out the neighborhood conditions that we think drive unhealthy behavior and downstream stress-related physiology. Um, we also do some intervention work. This is collaborative work with a colleague at the University of Georgia named Gene Brody. Um, and gene has been working for decades um, in small rural towns in Georgia within about three or four hours of Atlanta. And for those of you who know the geography of chronic health problems and longevity in the United States, what you know is that these rural towns sit um, in the southeastern portion of the country where life expectancy is quite low and rates of cardiometabolic disease and stroke are quite high relative to the rest of the country. This is from that Chetty paper that Teresa mentioned. And the parts of the country work, we're working in, men have an average of about four to five years lower life expectancy than in other parts of the country. So these are under-resourced, small rural towns. Um, and we've been working along with Gene for years to try to intervene in those towns and build resilience in kids' lives so they'll lead healthier, longer, more productive lives. Um, just to give you a sense of the sample we're working with, this is a sample that was recruited about 20 years ago when they were 11 years old. Um, and they were recruited into a two-arm intervention style that involved both an 11-year-old child and his, her, and his or her mother, typically. About half of the families are below the federal poverty threshold. About 10% of the parents have a college degree. So this is a relatively disadvantaged sample by demographic standards. There is a pretty simple psychosocial intervention that happens when the kids are 11. So this is right before they move into adolescence, into middle school. Um, it involves eight weekly sessions that's led by a community facilitator, not a professional, um, but somebody who's been trained. There's a lot of focus on managing stress and realistically giving parents and kids a sense of what's to come during adolescence. Because these are low-income rural black kids, there's a lot of very frank discussions about the challenges they're going to face with racism and discrimination, institutional challenges, interpersonal challenges, peer pressure, a lot of focus on coping. But the underlying idea is that what you want to do is leverage the relationships in the family and leverage the relationships in peers to create positive cognitive, emotional, and behavior change. And then you're not going to change behavior directly. You're going to change the relationships kids have and the supports they have for managing stress. And we found in follow-up studies 10 to 15 years after the intervention that there are fairly dramatic changes in health, um, both in the periphery and in the brain, associated with participation in this intervention. So here's an eight-year follow-up where we're looking at concentrations of a bunch of different inflammatory biomarkers in the periphery, which we know are important in cardiometabolic health. Um, and in some cancers and in brain health. And you can see the intervention, strong African-American families, is associated with a marked reduction in all six of these inflammatory biomarkers. Um, here are some studies we did of amygdala and hippocampal gray matter when the subjects were 25 years old, so 14 years after the intervention. And what you can see is that in two hippocampal subregions and in the amygdala, Kids who, and kids who participated in the intervention, there was no association between volume at 25 years old and the number of years of their life that they had lived below the poverty threshold. Whereas for kids who didn't go through the intervention, you see the expected correlation where more years of poverty is associated with disparities in volume 14 years later. We've looked at metabolic syndrome again at 25 years. And again, what you see is the kids who went through this intervention have lower rates of metabolic syndrome when they're 25. And that's particularly true if they were raised in families where um, there were difficulties with parenting and difficulties with family relationships to begin with. So 
Those are the findings, and this, most of the variance by this is actually carried not by changes in kids' beliefs, not by changes in their attitude or behavior, but by changes in parenting and social relationships. So I would argue that's one interesting leverage point that we have with kids. Thanks.